the 90 is your station for talk and business with a powerful weekday lineup. From 6 to 10 a.m., it's the iconic Imus in the Morning program, followed by Chris Plant's unique take on politics. From noon till 3, it's the one and only Dennis Miller. Nighttime, it's money guru Dave Ramsey at 6, followed by Michael Savage and the Savage Nation at 9. Great shows and powerful personalities. It all starts weekday mornings at 6 with Imus on your station for talk and business. AM 790. Now, back to the Coalition on AM790 Talk and Business. Join in the conversation at 437-5000 or 888-345-0790. And you are listening to the Coalition live on Talk Radio AM790, your source for news and business. Of course, we can be found on Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio. Our website with our blog is at www.coalitionradio.us, where you will find the opinions in David of David Fisher, my co-host, regularly featured alongside of some rantings of some lunatic that he shares a microphone with on, <laughs> on a weekly basis. Uh, let me point out before we get into the next segment, uh, up on our homepage at coalitionradio.us uh, is our live unhinged uncensored and and well lubricated by alcohol uh live podcast from last week's benefit for uh Corey Agin uh Rhode Island or uh, recently passed uh, executive director of Rhode Island Normal down at the Fat Squir- Squirrel so if you want to hear what uh, what we sound like when there's no uh swear bump button in front of us <laughs> on the radio uh you can go ahead and tune into that's so right in right on our our home page coalition radio.us and joining us of course today is tim Faulkner. he's executive director of eco ri news can be found at eco ri.org i commend the site to your attention for a very valuable perspective of what's going on in terms of energy energy legislation energy futures here within rhode island and the greater new england um let me set the framework here because I want to get into a fairly involved technical discussion with you guys. I come at this from the Hammenegger perspective when I talk about energy and energy usage. Um, people like me over the last few years have been largely convinced when possible, and it's not possible for me, by the way, but when possible to switch to natural gas. Um, we have been convinced by a certain portion of the media that alternative energy does not seem to scale well to large production. Uh, we have been convinced that a number of alt energy projects, whether they be wind, where they be uh, whether they be sun based, whatever, uh, will ultimately increase our immediate energy costs exponentially. People like me are sort of at their wits' end, particularly here in Rhode Island with its damaged economy, to meet our current energy bills, if you will. And the the I mean the bump that we just got, and we're going to get another one in like six or eight months, right? From from right. National Grid, right? And it's been framed as a result of the failure of our infrastructure and the failure, if you will, of our pipeline. Or as you, Dave, in our offline conversations, you talked about supply, supply, supply. So we come along, and a company called Spectra wants to expand a pipeline. So by definition, the mainstream media and the talking heads, as is the case of the Keystone Pipeline, say, sounds great. Creates jobs, creates jobs. That's the mantra for everything these days, whether it be the paw socks or energy issues. It creates jobs. So why could you possibly be against it? So I guess if you guys could start from the beginning, talk about the evolution, the development of the project itself, the company, really give voice to what you feel are some significant issues behind the scenes that may not necessarily make it topside to the ham and eggers like me who quite frankly are struggling to pay our utility bills i mean i i listened all night last night what what wakes up a middle-aged guy these nights um the sound of his furnace turning on when, it, when, it, when it's seven degrees so i'll set the stage uh mr faulkner just give us a, a background of, of give us the big picture well the big picture is that they, as you said, they want to increase natural gas capacity into New England and the Northeast, and primarily that natural gas is going to come from the fracking fields of Pennsylvania and the Marcellus Shale. So they they have the supply, and the answer, according to the pipeline companies and to the political leadership so far, at least in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, is to make the pipelines bigger and bring more natural gas into the region. Uh, the big 
you know, as far as the price goes, I mean, I think that's that's that no, that's what they said is they're they're saying is the is the motivation for it. But they really also have intentions, and Dave can speak to this: is that there's they've already are seeking approval to reverse some of those pipelines that are that end up in bought in the Boston area essentially, and have them go north to Nova Scotia where they can export the natural gas. So the natural gas isn't just coming to help out local Rhode Islanders and residents and businesses; it's also so they can ship it elsewhere. So. How do you factor that into what the savings are going to be for the average person? I don't know, but it's it's a lot more than it, it than just trying to bring more natural gas and bring well, our price. Down. You reported uh, in your story here, which you can find on ecori.org. That's e c o r i dot org. Uh, a story with the headline: Energy companies keep quiet on this front. And you report here that uh, it's to the tune of eight hundred million cubic feet a day that may be exported out of the region to Nova Scotia for, for export? Yeah. I mean, it's this hub in the Boston area also gets uh, natural gas pipelines that run through Massachusetts as well, and uh, they're, the owner of that, Kinder Morgan, is looking to expand capacity on that as well. So, yeah, they. I mean, I think the sky's the limit as far as the volume that they want to put through there. And obviously, as you bring more natural gas, you increase the risks from pollution, from fires, explosions. Uh, they have compressor stations that they have to put in every 50 miles or so, and there's one in Burrowville, and there's uh, a proposal right now to expand that uh, significantly. And if you probably have, you can't really get back there and see it, but the facility's huge. It's about five acres, and they have these massive compressors that are, you know, bigger than the engines that you'll find on a, you know, a tanker ship. They're 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 really big, and they're creating a lot of concern among neighbors and health risks among environmental groups. Or uh, is a point that they're raising. So. Yeah, I mean it's they're just trying to get as much as they can in, really, uh, and and do what they can with it to increase profits for the most part. So I, I want to uh, just for those people listening, when we say something like expanding this pipeline, we're not actually they're not they're not expanding the pipeline. What they're doing is proposing uh, upgrading the compressor stations along the pipeline to increase the pressure, thus delivering more natural gas through that pipeline. Now. Uh, when I started to look into this, uh, one of the things that I found out was this this pipeline runs about 220 miles, I think, into New England, like up the East Coast into New right, England. That, that Algonquin, New, New Jersey, and goes yeah, that Algonquin New York and, kind of yep. spur of the of the gas pipelines. Um, and they're talking about upgrading every compressor station along the pipeline, but only about 40 miles of actual pipeline of the 220 miles uh, would be upgraded. Now. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon to figure out, you know, if you doubled the water pressure in your home overnight, uh, you'd be looking at a flooded basement. Your pipes would burst because they're, they're just not designed to handle the, the increased load. Um, so, you know, that was the first kind of red flag to me on this. Like, OK, if you're going to if you're going to upgrade the pipeline, then upgrade the pipeline. Don't just increase the pressure like you got you to have some type of precautions in there to make sure that. These things aren't going to blow up all over New England, all up and down the East Coast. And don't forget that the pipeline is 60 years old. This is not a new pipeline. Right. It's one of the oldest in the country, actually. Um, so, you know, and, and when you look at it again, this company, Spectra, does not have the most stellar safety record uh, when you go back into, you know, natural gas leaks and spills and, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, citations from EPA and, and certainly state, uh, you know, state environmental management agencies. Uh, so that, you know that was another red flag for me. Uh, you know, if if you look at the history and and people have died or gotten hurt or, uh, for God forbid, had their had their you know the air they breathe you know affected somehow, that's a that should be a pretty big red flag for anyone. Right. Yeah. The increased pressure does it essentially increases the risks that come with uh, emissions and toxic emissions and explosions and other things. So, right. You know, you know the more you put through that pipeline, the more. Uh, risk there is for for harm to happen. So, uh, I think a lot of the environmentalists are just concerned that this you know proposed expansion is not taking into account you know other alternatives as such as increasing the amount of renewable energy or increasing storage uh, of natural gas you know, in and around in parts of New England, so you don't really have to put all that pressure on the pipeline. And, and so, I think there's a lot of questions being raised about why why can't they look at maybe taking a more comprehensive look at the whole energy demand need and what alternatives are there they can do to address it.
Well, talk to me about alternatives, because on one hand, we've got several fronts we're fighting the energy battle on. Uh, number one, you know, we've got this increased, you know, incredible reliance on oil. When you talk about transportation issues, you know, Warren Buffett's railroads are making quite the dollar, if you will, on transporting oil because of, again, infrastructural issues. And we've seen a number of cases lately where, particularly out just out in Ohio, where Warren Buffett's, I believe it was Warren Buffett, I could be wrong, but one of the major railroads just had a major collision and you had a spill and you had fires and you had pristine land destroyed. And yet, on the other hand, you've got the potential for pipeline. What, What is the solution? Is there a solution? And what technology would you advocate in the bitterest, coldest winter in New England history um, to to just get people warm? I mean, what's, what's the path forward? I don't know if there's a, a single solution, but I think it just goes back to the diversification standpoint. And the, the quick and easy answer is to bring more natural gas in. But again, it's just a, it's a commodity, right? So if you're putting all your eggs in one basket to heat your homes and provide and power your power plants, I mean, I think 95% of the power that's generated in Rhode Island is from natural gas. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, you want to diversify that just you know, not for necessarily safety reasons, but for financial reasons, right? That price is going to increase. <laughs> why should Why should we have an Energy Thirty Eight Studios, right. you know, a fuel source Thirty Eight Studios, where right. you know, or uh, you know, CVS with like the crazy tax breaks they get? You know, fifteen million dollars of job job development, CVS gets fourteen million. Again, all eggs one basket. Exactly. Right, but I mean, I mean, now, and I, and I hate to use this word because I, I know my Dave will, eyes will explode. But wasn't natural gas a replacement for clean coal? Well, that's the, I mean, that's the, the argument, you know, it is, frankly, it's a more efficient burning fuel. Uh, it's certainly a cleaner burning fuel. There's, uh, there's no question about that. But it has none of the transportation issues other than putting it on the back of a train and, 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 and driving it to Well, the- and, you know, compressed liquefied natural, you can ship that in a number of different ways. Um, certainly, even shipping it over the road is not as, as volatile as, say, a tanker full of oil, um, right. because natural gas is going to dissipate rather, rather quickly. Um, you know, even liquid natural gas, once it, it gets out of that compression, it turns gaseous almost immediately. I mean, there's the chance for explosion, but hopefully there's no fire if there's some kind of accident like that. But I think the, uh, you know, the overwhelming, I think Tim's right, that, that there needs to be this diversified portfolio. I mean, look, Burlington, Vermont just went 100% renewable. The entire city is powered by renewable energy. Uh, you know, it's it's just as cold and snowy in Burlington, Vermont, as it is here in Rhode Island. I think one of the uh, one of the things I think that we really could do, and I think would be a super boon to the state, is I think the state should set up a fund that give everybody whose house is feasible for it, give them one solar panel, give them one, just give them one. You know, if it's a few thousand bucks. Uh, you know that that over a large scale area. Uh, you know, some of the numbers I've seen. Uh, you know, if you could put uh, a 96 mile by 96 mile square solar, you know, power generator in the middle of the desert in Arizona that would power the entire country. Now it sounds like a big, you know, 96 miles by 96 miles, but it, it, you know that's nothing in the midst of the the Sonoran Desert, or you know, that's a that's a speck on the map in the, in the Sonoran Desert. But again, that would be a, a one egg, you know, a one basket scenario. So I think diversity is the way to get there. Heating is is you know it's a different. It's kind of a different animal because when it comes to electricity, there's only a few ways you can you can generate. I mean, heat you could either have coal, I mean, uh, uh, oil or natural gas coming into your house, or if you're electric, you know, it's powered by whatever it el- else is out there. Um, so I think you know newer buildings are certainly doing more uh, with electric heating, things like heat pumps, you know, where you have like geothermal heat, uh, which is expensive at this point, almost prohibitively expensive, um, depending on you know how far you have to drill down to get to the water table. But a relatively efficient uh, technology and uh, and low impact to the environment for sure. Tim, talk to me a little bit about fracking because that's another one of the great bogeymen out there. Um, on one hand, fracking is being heralded as a technological advance for the ages, uh, that it has the potential to free uh, America from the energy uh, shackles, you will, of the Middle East, that on a geopolitical basis it has changed the balance of power in, in the world economy, particularly on oil-dependent states like Iran and Russia, which have a price point that they effectively need to derive income from because of their nationalized industries. I mean, I, I believe... Well, correct me if I'm wrong. In, in the case of the Soviet Union, and I think it's sixty or seventy dollars per barrel is what they need 
to run the country and run their uh, military-industrial complex.